So, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, today is the last uh, meeting of the uh, last uh, We have this screen, and uh, it, it, has, it has a, as you see, a special format. Uh, it's a kind of soccer or ping pong <laughs> <laughs> among two teams. And, 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 and all, you, all of you know that uh, we wanted to finish the, the, the term uh, having giving voice to the students and, and because we have wonderful students, I don't know if you know it, and, and, <laughs> and instructors as well. And uh, we have won, we the DSD, you, you have won two interesting uh, awards, uh, both of them uh, related with uh, uh, sustainable issues or thermodynamic issues in my language. And, 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 and one of them is especially unique because it's not very usual that uh, uh, an award for students can be built, can be built at such a speed and, and it's built and they are going to present not the project but the work that is built on the project. Um, the instructors are Holly Samuelson, all of you know her, and Mark Mulligan. Uh, you are the best known in the school by everyone, so <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to be introduced. And Kiel, who is the other corner. So we will begin with uh, the, the Hollis uh, group and then we will continue with uh, your group and the format, you know that usually we have like a 20-30 minute talk and then we have uh, responses by, by, by uh, faculty uh, or PhDs or leaders. Today uh, everyone can talk, can interrupt and can, can make questions while or after. Okay. I think it's uh, unfair to say that this is my group. I have <laughs> almost nothing to do with this project. This is definitely the student team. But I'm going to introduce them just because I know that none of these groups of students would brag about themselves, so that's what I'm going to do here. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about building performance simulation, or the computerized prediction of how a building's going to perform in terms of thermal issues, energy issues, daylight, moisture, etc. This has traditionally been a topic that's been the purview of engineers and specialized consultants. But as of late, architects are getting in on the action. And this is a good thing, because as we all know, the opportunity to influence a project and to affect change decreases over time, and the cost of those changes increases over time. Architects are the ones that are involved in the building project from day one. And so whether we're doing simulation ourselves, or we're engaging with specialists, uh, we need to be involved and we need to be starting this early. In that light, a few organizations have started to uh, promote design competitions for students. So I just want to talk briefly about two uh, before we move on to uh, the main event. This is the Northeast Sustainable Energy Association, and they held a student uh, energy modeling competition, design competition, to design net zero projects in Holyoke, Massachusetts. And the GSD entered two uh, entrants and won first place uh, in those two divisions that they entered. So I'm going to talk about the first team here. Uh, Johan Stouts, Saurabh Shrestha, sorry, Shrestha, Thomas Sherman, and uh, this advised by Kimo. So this team boldly took on the task of redesigning this abandoned paper mill in Holyoke, Massachusetts that has almost zero daylighting. It has a solid brick facade, which is very difficult to insulate, and they boldly decided to take this on and turn it into not only rentable office space, but net zero operating energy uh, office space. And when we talked about this curve, you can tell that they are way out here. The building is already built. So what they did was pretty interesting. They decided to remove a big, here's the existing building. They decided to remove a big chunk of the floor to make a courtyard to get daylighting in. Uh, they added some envelope elements. They added uh, a double skin to the facade. And then here's the proposed So here you can see the double skin facade that they uh, proposed. They also uh, developed a scheme of thermal zoning, so they would only heat the interior portions that they needed to be occupied out of this giant industrial building. And then they also delved into the mechanical systems, and in this case, adding solar thermal, and as well as active thermal storage, or seasonal thermal storage, so that they would tap into the groundwater to store some of the heat throughout the year. This was the second entrance. 
entry into the Nancy competition. This was Kanika Aurora, Pavane Sharma, Roman Royal, and Maha Sarenu. And they won the residential new construction. So here they were designing a certain number of residential units in Holyoke, Massachusetts. And they took on a three-pronged approach. So first, starting with the passive climate responsive, low-cost solutions. So you can see here that they have adjustable solar shading. They have a solar chimney to induce buoyancy flow ventilation. Then they moved on to using efficient building systems, and then finally moved on to adding a renewable system. You can see solar thermal and thermal voltaic panels. I should mention that all of the teams worked on this on their own time over January. And both teams won uh, not only a cash prize, but they won registration to the building uh, simulation, uh, the building energy conference, as well as uh, travel accommodations oh, cool. to Boston. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which, if you're a GST student, it's practically a foreign country, so I thought they took advantage of the travel. <laughs> so this group took uh, great care in designing their um, daylighting strategy. The sites as given were not ideally oriented to the sun, so they took great to figure out how they would orient their glazing and the shaping strategies. And I won't go through their whole design, but I think that, and I won't bore you with this slide, but I think it's interesting that this was meant to be affordable as well. So they took into account how much would their solutions cost. And they looked at, starting with the zero cost changes, and they looked at with every step that they took, how much would it reduce the operating energy to the point that they got to what they predicted would be um, an energy positive solution that would create more energy. So now moving on to the main event, this is the team of Apol Foil, Artiga Zeta, Subrub Scripta, Kia Jin Jin. And they were competing in a competition sponsored by the International Building Performance Simulation Association, or IBIPSA, if you're into affordable acronyms. Now, IBIPSA has a conference once every two years internationally. So this was in 2013 in Chambéry, France. In the off years, individual chapters like the United States can have their own conference. Uh, so IBIPSA has hosted a few years now a student energy modeling competition. Like simulation in general, this has traditionally been the purview of engineers. But I, and to give an example, the students were given a house, a new house, in Chambéry, France, and they were given these plans and sections. And they were tasked with making a net zero design. They were allowed to maybe change the glazing, maybe add some solar shading, and to then concentrate on the active HVAC and solar thermal systems. I think that the brilliance of this team's solution was they approached it like architects, and they did what architects do best, and they redefined the problem. Or maybe that's a euphemism for breaking the rules. But basically they said, we're not going to attack the energy issues in this building in an active way unless we first take an advantage of the passive opportunities that are to us. So I thought that was pretty ingenious, Speak for themselves, and I will hand it over to you. Speak to the party. Yeah. And I forgot to say that Diego Ibarra is also part of the advisors of the group. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. First of all, thank you, Tony and Diego, for like, you know, supporting us throughout all this process. I thank you for, like, you know, if you were here because of you, we were not being here. Um, so uh, this competition, as Holly mentioned, is the 13th International Conference of the International Building Performance Simulation Association. And um, this year, every two years, it's been held, and it, this year has been um, basically held in Chambry, France. That was actually our site as well. What we were given was a typical uh, suburban uh, two-story house. Um, obviously not well designed, as you can see, uh, the plan was just a mess. And we had one section, they had given us a weather file, too much, um, a weather file. We were told not to touch the geometry at all. However, we were allowed to actually play around with the facade composition they had. Um, what we were given uh, was lighting, equipment, and occupancy note. They were fixed. We were not allowed to touch those. Uh, we were also given a very tight thermal comfort uh, that we needed to abide by 
um, throughout the year. Um, and also, we were required to provide them with a energy plus building, meaning that whatever the building is using, plus more. Uh, so, as I just described the project, really there is no room for architects here. It's, it's geared towards engineers, it's supposed to be uh, basically design a building system that works the most efficiently. Um, obviously, that is not the direction we wanted to take this to, so we were thinking we need to actually understand and we define the problem by actually introducing architectural interventions. Um, so that means that we need to take risks and break some rules, and that was given and we were planning to go with that. Uh, the first step we did was to actually define our methodology, what we are planning to do and how we are planning to address this problem. Uh, we started obviously with our base model. Uh, looking into see uh, where is located, like really understanding this locality, what are what is the environment um, that what is the weather uh, chart uh, that we are given, what are the potentials and how we can actually capitalize on those. Defining the hierarchy within these strategies and kind of uh, decide which um, architectural intervention we want to take. Uh, obviously, that means that our, from our intuition, we know it's a better choice, so we run the simulation, and there's two things can happen. One, we are going to get our expectation, uh, or we don't. And if we don't get the expectation, we are understanding either the model is wrong, or our intuition was wrong. And actually, we're going to go through the project. Both two cases has happened. So it became this kind of a two-way street between us designing, testing our intervention, really understanding, uh, and using simulation as a design, um, um, a, as a design, um, um, the best way to describe it is basically you, what we are trying to actually use the simulation to verify our design options and move on with every single step to get to the final result. Now, um, Talking about just the weather fight quickly, most of you guys, I believe, can read this, but for those of you um, who cannot, um, have, are not familiar with this, we have our month uh, uh, up here. This is our temperature. The maroon kind of reddish band is defining the highest temperature and the lowest temperature within, month, uh, within each month, and this darker line defining our average diurnal temperatures. Uh, this yellow line right on the following this uh, is our direct solar gain, and this blue band is our comfort range. Um, we run the base model, as we mentioned, as I mentioned, and on the, here you see the energy consumption of the building, it's what our per meter square, and the red bars are showing how much heating we need, uh, the blue are showing our uh, cooling loads, yellow is our lighting, and the equipment and auxiliaries are great, those are fixed, we cannot touch that. Uh, so these are some of the strategies we, from the get-go we kind of understood through our weather file uh, and kind of decide to aim for those. Uh, looking at uh, the summer month, it's obvious that we can actually use uh, natural ventilation. We have a good temperature in average, uh, so we can tap into that. Also this diurnal shift tells us we can use thermal mass. So we can actually engage with the thermal property of material to address some of the problems. Uh, the other issue that we are looking into is our cold months, meaning that when you are looking at the uh, the amount of direct solar you get in the beginning of the year, it's it's easy to envision that you can actually use sort of some of the um, solar gains uh, for passive gains of heating. Trumbull seems like a good idea. However, we are expecting to see this strategy not working because during the December, we are not getting enough solar gains. Uh, so at that point, we are assuming um, we are going to be coupling the building um, with the earth to actually uh, reduce our heat, rate, uh, uh, heat load. So uh, at this point, we are hoping that we would actually reduce energy uh, enough so we can actually push it to the next step, which actually going to the surplus of energy. It was a way we could have actually made the competition. So that would be the next goal. Now, Akub and uh, uh, Kira are going to go to more detail. So as Arthur mentioned, uh, there were a couple of things which um, the brief said we could modify. One of them was uh, facade composition and the glazing types. Um, the simulations really informed us that uh, glazing was actually uh, one of the weakest points where heat loss was happening. So we decided to change the we decided to change the uh, glazing from a single 
glazed system uh, which was given to us to a double glazed system. Um, and on the graph, that uh, is the same graph. Uh, so, so energy consumption on the y-axis and the uh, minus on the lower axis. And the gray bands is basically the energy consumption of the base model. So you can see there's a significant reduction in the heating demand in the winter months, especially with just because of the glazing, just because of the change in glazing. Um, however, because we wanted to approach the project architecturally, uh, we started looking at different uh, asset strategies. And um, again, as Arthur mentioned, during the summers, because of uh, because the average temperature lie within the comfort range, and because of the uh, big difference in the diurnal temperatures, uh, natural ventilation and thermal mass were uh, to be to, uh, had to be included. Um, so using simulations, we realized that to for natural ventilation to really work, we had to open up the floor plans, and on the lower floor, uh, on the lower floor, we basically removed the internal partitions uh, and to dry the external air. And on the upper floors, we added uh, transom windows over the over the doors in the room and used the core. Uh, which was bigger than the uh, the base case to drive that external air to cool the building. Um, to reduce the difference in the daytime and the nighttime temperatures, we uh, we increase the term, the increase the distance the the thickness of the floor slab and also remove the finish the floor finishing that was given to us in the base uh, to expose the thermal mass so that we could uh, we could explore the thermal properties of the material. Uh, so this was something that. We really were not allowed, or was basically where we modified the design which was given to us. Um, so again, the gray bars are uh, energy consumption after we change the glazing, and you can see that we were just with natural ventilation and uh, thermal mass, we were able to get rid of the cooling loads in the summers and also achieve a significant heating reduction in the winter months. Um, so. Now that the summers were okay, we started looking at the at the winter months, and uh, because we had a significant direct solar gain in the winter months, we uh, we proposed a secondary glazed skin uh, about a meter away from the main south facade. We used we did a couple of iterations and used simulations to optimize that distance uh, to work in the best way. Um, and in the beginning, we started using we started with a with a single glaze uh, skin. However, our intuition was really uh, you know was, uh, simulations suggested that uh, during the night there was a lot of heat loss from that single uh, single skin single glaze skin. So uh, we changed it to double glass facade, which uh, again simulations using simulations we were able to verify that uh, that was actually working better. Um, also, for during the summer's time, because we are we had natural ventilation, so we made the skin completely openable, so that uh, the air can move as as it's supposed to. Um, so the the bars again are these are the energy consumption uh, after the natural ventilation and the uh, thermal mass, and just with the thermal wall, we were able to reduce the energy uh, heating demand in in the winter months. However. Because there was not a lot of uh, direct solar gain in December, there was a significant heating demand still left there. Um, for which we uh, plan to use uh, berming. And we basically added uh, berming on all sides of the, of the model and, uh, and uh, use simulations. But uh, we realized that adding berming on all sides were actually again working against what we had thought of, and uh, we were getting really uncomfortable high temperatures in the interior. Uh, so after a couple of iterations and simulations going back and forth, we realized that just adding uh, berming on the north side and up to a depth of 1.2 meters was the best optimized uh, um, option. The result of which you could clearly see in the reduction of heating demand in December, so that's basically the last stage, which is chrome uh, wall. And um, at this stage, we were actually convinced that that's the maximum, probably the maximum reduction in energy that we could achieve um, just with passive strategies. Um, and so compared with the base, is so the gray is the very first which we started with, the given thing. 
we are able to reduce the energy demand by 75% just by purely architectural means and no mechanical systems. Um, thank you, Jim, we'll go to the next step. Now we have reduced our energy oh, use. Okay. Energy use to very minimum. It was important to utilize the maximum solar energy to achieve a net positive energy design. Although this graph might look very complicated, uh, this middle line that represents the overall uh, solar radiation that we can use to design our renewable energy. Based on this data, we calculated the amount of energy that can be generated from the available solar radiation to fully compensate the energy uh, consumption. Through radiation analysis, we realized that the roof plane rotated at 35 degrees is the most efficient uh, for capturing solar radiation for both winter and summer. To use the solar generated energy more efficiently, we propose distributing 75% of roof area for PV and 25% for solar, solar thermal panel. And after all, at the end, we are able to generate 200% more energy we need, which is far exceeding the of the net zero drilling standard. By this time, you might be thinking, well, it's just an ugly house with a bunch of simulations. However, uh, our standard is pretty bold. The competition wanted us to simply design a system based on the set design. The diagram represents the committee's expectation for the competition participants' working process. Based on the set design, and design systems, uh, designing systems are given rules and uh, running the simulation to, to prove that we did the right equation solving. We started thinking as an architect, how should we approach this? And we wanted to make this project as a statement and focusing on the building of better design process than objects that, that use the least amount of operational energy through system selection. In order to do that, instead of designing with linear conventional process, we are trying to use simulation as a design verification tool. We designed the complex iterative process to filter out our wrong decision intuition. Although there were some times that we were not getting what we expected, we were very vigilant about figuring out why, and it was uh, and checking by going to going back to the previous simulation models. When we were, for example, we were when we were designing natural ventilation, natural ventilation simulation being the most trickiest one. We had to go through separate shoebox testing to verify the performance of the simulation before we can trust the process. And when, we're, when we were designing drum wall, through our initial simulation, we discovered the reverse conduction through a single pane when we went back to change the glazing system. When we were designing vermin, our first iteration with vermin on all four sides started to cause overheating for a few days of the year. After a few options of simulation process, we came to use vermin only, only on the north side, uh, and uh, to minimize the problem. At the end, we wanted our process to be sensible enough to check first, the process is correct, and second, our design intuition was correct. Uh, and this is how we made the model useful for the maximum opportunity we get. <laughs> So, um, so this project, uh, which uh, myself, Tom Sherman, and Anna um, are going to present, um, is the Horizon House. Which say so the um, name of everyone. Oh, I will. Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to introduce the background quickly right. of the competition. This also was a student uh, competition, which was an international competition funded by the Lixil Foundation. Um, in Japan, it's a corporation um, that makes um, sinks, toilets, windows, all these sort of things for homes. And they have um, this competition which has been going on for a few years. Um, the background was, like I said, retreat in nature. And this work represents um, eight GSD students. And with us today, there's uh, Mariano and Robert, um, Nate, myself, and Anna here. But there's others who uh, unfortunately couldn't make it today. And then our advisors, um, Mark Mulligan and Kyle Moe, who are also here today. 
Um, so just a little background. Um, this competition started as an in-house um, competition here at the GSD. We were selected out of 12 teams um, here internally. And then there were 12 um, schools that were invited to the competition um, from around the world. And in April, three of those teams were asked to um, present in Tokyo. And we, uh, we were one of those teams. We presented against um, the Technical University of Delft and then the University of Singapore. And ultimately, we um, were selected. And this is the end of the, um, the ceremony, this, accepting the award from Pedro Puno, who was on the review. And just, just for the flow of this presentation, um, we're going to discuss um, a number of different issues. But we'll follow uh, this sort of this path. We'll go from context to concept, development, construction, and then some, some of the ongoing research. Um, just understanding the context of um, this competition and the site, um, I'll start the, just to understand um, what Hokkaido is. It's uh, the most northern island uh, in Japan. And the weather it is pretty similar to uh, northern Maine. So it's a pretty northern climate. There's a lot of snow. And so this was very new territory for our team um, in terms of you know, what does it mean to design in that place, in that culture. Um, and in terms of understanding that context of what is Hokkaido, the, the brief of the competition asks us to design not only a sustainable house um, for the 21st century, but also really to think about um, what a retreat in nature means. So this is a very rural site. It's very different from sort of what you think of as Japan. The landscapes are very flat, and the memory of the horizon became very important for, for how we conceptualize this project. Um, also, depopulation um, in rural Japan is a big issue. This played into how we placed our design within this context of Hokkaido. Um, and also understanding the materiality that exists um, in this part of Japan. Um, there's a number of abandoned buildings. Um, there's, it's an extensive um, forestry region, an agricultural region. Um, it's really sort of a... Um, a, a real material source for most of Japan. So this was a very interesting um, site to work with. And then understanding just the basic site, um, which is, like I said, it's a rural site. It's a, a property that's owned as a corporate retreat for the Lixhill Foundation. And there's an existing um, series of houses. Our house was to be sited um, next to the barn house designed by Keio University. and then another house by Kengo Kuma. And just conceptually, um, as I mentioned, the horizon for our team became a really critical issue. We wanted to really emphasize this 360 degree view of the landscape from all spaces within the house and integrate this throughout the design. Um, but understanding that Hokkaido has deep snow in the winter time, this was sort of a problem. So we decided, um, well, why don't we raise this house up um, a meter above the snow so we can always have this view seasonal. And understanding um, that the snow could also become an additive element for insulation in the winter, maintaining this on the roof, but also um, allowing the snow to sort of wrap around the house as part of the conceptual design. And then ultimately, um, the orientation of the house, um, you know, larger windows facing south and whatnot, integrated with these design features was sort of the conceptual basis. Um, seasonally understanding how this, this might operate with um, the deep snow of the winter and the, and the, the tall grass um, during the summertime. And then just, just the layout and understanding how the house was, was designed. Um, the Genkan, which is a, um, culturally is very significant in Japan. It's a place where you remove your shoes. Um, but this is a, a not it's not a thermally uh, treated area, but it's a buffer zone, an entrance buffer, um, before getting into the house. And then the kitchen, bath, and bedroom, which are all on one level, but are each treated um, differently in terms of their surfaces. And then finally, um, the living space, which is elevated, um, as I said before, above the ground surface. And this really emphasizes views um, to the exterior. Um, and this living space becomes really central to 
this concept of how you occupy the floor and what does it mean to, to be in contact with that surface. And that, that, that surface contact uh, with the floor was really critical to how we understood this project thermodynamically. Um, we wanted to emphasize um, radiant surfaces as the primary heating system, but also understanding that each space and each activity has a specific um, need in terms of temperature and whatnot. So the, the spaces on the ground floor are heated with radiant floor heating, but the, the winter bedroom um, or the loft is not actually heated because the, the warm air rises up into that loft space. As you can see here, there's spatially the, the ground floor has the views to the landscape, but the, the loft space is very sort of contemplative. Um, it's a different type of space. But from a sustainability perspective, we really began thinking, you know, not only about the site, but also um, the materiality. And one of the reasons I think our project ultimately was selected is we took a very aggressive stance on um, using wood um, for almost every aspect of the project. We initially wanted to eliminate concrete and foundation, and we looked at the embodied energy comparisons between um, a wood foundation versus concrete. And uh, concrete is about eight times more uh, energy intensive. And this was a real basis for, for the design. And then understanding the materiality of the entire assembly, um, wood for the foundation, um, salvaged fencing for the facades, um, Japanese large for the framing, and then maintaining the snow on the roof in the wintertime as part of the insulation strategy. And I'll pass it on to Anna. Um, so, um, the big part, uh, or something that we got to enjoy very much during uh, this competition was that we got invited to go to Japan and spend the summer there and uh, work on the design development of the house. Um, so, that was hard at the very beginning because we had to move from the uh, models, physical models that we had made here um, as a set of iterations of what the design could be into something that had to be built. So. Uh, we developed some video models that uh, were based on parameters that allowed us to change the angle uh, at which the, the roof would uh, be able or not to hold the snow. Um, we could consider how much material we needed uh, by having a model that would give us the, the, the additional uh, or the addition of the of the, the members and such. And so, uh, three days after we got to Tokyo, uh, we flew to. Um, to Hokkaido with uh, Saikawa-san, uh, who was the project manager from King Okuma's office. So the whole process has been run in collaboration with their office, which has been a, a unique opportunity for us. And we got to meet with the local contractor and the caretaker. And so one of the things that we found uh, was that uh, the client, in this case, the like, Foundation, wasn't comfortable dealing with using uh, um, abandoned railroad ties because these are treated with creosote, which are toxic. And so usually you can use them outside, but if they are to be placed uh, for residential use, um, that didn't seem to be uh, good for them, even though we were proposing that they would be set on the outside for the space of the, of the house. So instead what we did was to try to find, and according to what Tom was explaining, our original idea of using materials that were local, or at least from the region, we found um, a provider from Northern Hokkaido that could give us the same product and so maintaining the idea of using all uh, off-the-shelf products to dimension and distribute the, the product uh, So um, uh, Tom just mentioned that too, but uh, we wanted to use abandoned buildings, and so we reclaimed those materials and put them in our facade. We took some pieces and made these uh, mock-ups back in Tokyo. And although we understand that going from design to realization, and in this case we had to deal with uh, a negotiation uh, because uh, Japanese uh, culture of architecture has its own regulations and coding and, and how it works. We are pretty happy with how it all came out because both uh, uh, the programming, the ground floor and the loft remain uh, the same. Of course, we had to update some sections and use the skylights that meant the sizing that the company was giving us uh, because both the, um, of the um, uh, like the products from the toilets and the glazing around the house were from the seal, they were provided by them. Um, but that was interesting, just to try to adopt something that we have thought of, not having those products in mind, um, making sure that they're safe. Uh, so after the summer was done, 
uh, they took over the construction because my Japanese is not very good, so they they were not okay with us staying over. Uh, so anyhow, uh, the construction began, and this has been an amazing uh, thing for us because they were sending us pictures every three or four days, uh, keeping us updated with how the process was going. Uh, this was um, um, in court, like uh, according to what we had uh, explained. Uh, we wanted a uh, very superficial excavation to uh, invade the ground as, uh, as minimal as possible. And then we installed the uh, ground, uh, the, the wooden base on a, on a layer of gravel, and then a small footings of concrete. So uh, we used very, very um, small amounts of concrete. And of course, there were, uh, this is a highly seismic zone, so we had to use uh, vaulted and head uh, wood joints. The frame was made of Japanese lodge, again, a uh, product from the region, and it was built really, really fast. Like, this happening a couple of months, we were just like, from one, from one weekend to Monday, they were sending us this, and we just didn't know how that happened overnight. <laughs> it was really, really fascinating. Uh, so th this is one of the last pictures that we got before we went there. Um, in 2013, someone and I got to go there three times, and they covered their expenses, we don't know why, but uh, it, was, it was just amazing, and in this case, Mark, was with us too, uh, so I took the picture of, uh, of the guys outside. <coughs> and, but that's not the end of it, and Tom is gonna explain what we're doing right now in terms of uh, the research right now. So I'll just explain, I think, um, what's interesting also about this project is the ongoing uh, work that we're doing um, with the University of Tokyo and the Shiro uh, lab there. Um, we actually have um, a fellow GSD student who's there helping us and he was very instrumental in the design of the, the heating systems. So this on the left, this is the um, thermal mass, which is embedded into the floor. It's gravel and it has uh, piping running through it. And then the, the house is heated um, through a wood stove system. Actually, it's a custom heat exchanger. So since the house is used intermittently um, as this retreat, um, economically, it made sense to use um, just sort of the forestry um, cutoffs right from the site as our primary heating system, but we have the thermal mass to help balance out um, heating needs. And then, like I said before, the floors are radiantly heated. This is an image from construction of the, um, the submerged earth duct, which um, delivers fresh air to the house um, throughout the season. So that's tempered um, to the temperature of the ground uh, throughout the year. And then just quickly, the explain a little bit about the wall section. We're, we utilize both an exterior sunshade um, primarily in the south, south facade um, to help with um, kind of glare and summertime uh, lighting. And then on the interior, there's a radiant shade, which we hope to continue to experiment with um, that helps for, for nighttime heat loss. Um, and then this is a diagram showing actually the radiant flooring system as installed. And um, each of those are sort of uh, based upon the types of programs in each of those spaces. And then um, I marked on here, there's where there's actual temperature and humidity sensors. So this house was extensively, um, we set it up with over 23 sensors. Um, and this this is an image of the website which um, was set up by the University of Tokyo. Um, so we were hoping to continue to do some testing on the house um, beyond just the, the stay that we were there in November. So this is sort of an ongoing research project, which I think is very exciting. Um, and then these are final uh, images of the house as built, um, and these were from November and then throughout the winter. Uh, one thing that we, uh, um, while we were there with Marcos for, for the opening ceremony, uh, we got a, a couple of groups of students from the area, and we, we got to explain the house to them, and they, they couldn't believe that our house was in this one. So once again, this was something that was important to us. We were bringing back in memory of the place, so we were using materials that had that uh, image to them, that, that feature. And we wanted to incorporate time into the equation of how the house is going to behave over time. Like, uh, just because the base looks very new, but eventually it's going to uh, catch up with the rest of the house. And I also wanted to tell you about a little anecdote, uh, because we got to stay at the house. That is something that maybe you build a house, but you will never live there. Um, we're not going to live there, but we got to spend a couple of nights and it was very nice in general, uh, but on the second night we had an earthquake, and I remember it was like four in the morning or whatever, and I couldn't go back to sleep. And you would say, okay, it was really, it was really intense, right? Mark told us that the day after there was a 5.0 earthquake, 
But the thing is that I didn't, I couldn't go back to sleep because it was scary, which is the thing I think it, I spent so much time making this model in Vina, and now it works. They have to say. Uh, so I think that we take take that with us. You know, like we got that experience going from design to uh, the process of learning about the culture, which was extremely helpful, and then building it in this case. And just to finish up, uh, we've been posting many many pictures. Some of them uh, are on Facebook right now. Uh, so if you want to go check the website, it's uh, available. And on Monday, we're opening an exhibition here by the elevator, uh, which we hope you get to uh, have a look at. Um, Mariano and Rob have been in charge of uh, getting it together. So we have all the drawings from different places and um, a detailed timeline of how the whole process went. Nate's model. Oh, and Nate and Matt just finished his model too, which is the most updated one. So I should add it to that one of pictures that you saw before. I think this is the nicest one. So please just come have a look. Thank you. Yeah, we have some time, so uh, let me, let me, before we open this, let me ask Kiel and Mark uh, to make some brief comments. Sure, well, uh, this is actually, I have to say, I know that I might be the most famous person in the building or something like that, um, <laughs> but actually this is the first time that I have sponsored a competition, uh, you know, outside the GSD, and uh, it was definitely, as you said, Inyaki, it was that uh, the sort of the motivation of if you win, you get to build the house. That seemed to me like an incredibly valuable experience to students. And so that was for sure the appeal and the reason to put some resources and some effort towards this. And I was so obviously so proud of this team for, for winning and for the wonderful experience they had. And it, um, it makes me um, think a lot about uh, sort of the, just the general genre of student competitions. It's very common for students to win awards and to you know build a resume and to, to test their abilities in this way. And I, I think that the work that this other group has shown is also you know completely um, amazing to me in the way that you thought outside the box and the way you responded not only to the expectations of the sponsors but you know above and beyond, providing maybe a new role. A new, uh, a new way of thinking about how a competition should be responded to. And I think, you know, I'm obviously I'm very, very proud of the work that, that, that our team has done. But it, it also made me think, well, maybe there is something a little bit staid and a little bit, um, uh, the typical student competition maybe needs to be rethought. And Lixel has definitely provided a model for what the educational experience is uh, as a result of a competition. I don't think it's the same as presenting to a jury in-house here. It's, it, uh, they've actually shown how to mobilize the resources of a, a major sponsor like this. I, I, I wanted to add maybe that um, Lixel has been super happy with the team and their dedication. It was more than what they expected from a team flying in from you know around the world. Uh, obviously, they took things very seriously. But um, that we've been invited uh, to have an ongoing relationship with Lixel to that Harvard the GSD should feel like this house is also a retreat house for us. It actually takes quite a long time to get exactly. there. We fly to Tokyo, <laughs> and then it still takes quite a long time to get there. So it's a real retreat, believe me. Uh, uh, but, um, but that they're interested in the ongoing monitoring, but also adaptations that might happen to this house over time. So we should consider that uh, not just the work of this team, but also as something that represents our, you know, the newly established relationship between the GSD and, and Lixel. Also, I'm really, really encouraged by the way that these guys have developed an ongoing relationship with Tokyo University and their uh, building simulation, their building monitoring uh, capacities there. It's something that we can't do remotely, but they actually are able to. I hope that these kinds of, um, you know, the outcome of more student competitions should be, let's say, expanding this kind of kind of network. Yeah. We're very lucky. I mean, frankly, it's set up for us. But, um, you know, as we can sort of show this example to the outside world, hopefully more competitions of this ilk will, will, will be going on. And uh, I think maybe lastly, I just think that it was really, really useful for us. I'm going back now to last April when our team presented together with uh, other universities, Delft and National University of Singapore, um, who have fantastically imaginative schemes as well. And I just think that um, the more that we could find
find ourselves in positions to have those kinds of comparisons and debates, but also uh, finding commonalities with other universities. That was a really <coughs> positive outcome, and maybe not something that was originally envisioned as, as a main point for this competition, but certainly um, a very welcome outcome. Um, just picking up on that last point, um, it was awesome to watch these guys present with these other universities, uh, but from like Kingo Kuman's point of view, there was no competition, even though it was a design competition. When it was his turn to speak about all of the entries, he basically just threw the microphone down to the GSD team one. They were just like, so clearly better than the other students. It was, it was pretty impressive. But I just want to point out that um, this is, you know, this the Horizon House team was particularly satisfying working with Mark and everybody, but watching you know MLA students and MARC students yes. and those students from different concentrations all working on this house. Like it, it's one of the few GSD projects that I, I've been that I've even seen at the GSD where we have that many disciplines working on something real and then seeing what it actually provides it is a real clear indication to me that we need more of this kind of work in the GSD. Mm -hmm. like, there's amazing stuff going on in each of the disciplines and each of the areas of research and everything. But it's most interesting when we start to put it all together as a really compelling aggregate. And that's what the GSD is, and I think that's one reason I like this project so much. Good point. Yeah. Do you, do you want to, you haven't, you haven't talked. No, I, I guess I, I don't have to, but uh, just to you know, reiterate the, the approach this, this team had to at least the building energy modeling competition. And uh, I've seen a lot of the competitions then. And an early discussion that we had, they had it clear that uh, to win such a thing when you are competing against these crazy engineers that are probably going to pass this uh, model of the house to genetic algorithms and you know, get the ideal solution, they really did a great job thinking outside of the box. And you know, pushing the boundaries not far enough to get you know to break the rules basically. They broke small rules that the the, the basically the jury allowed, uh, and still achieve an amazing uh, amazing result. So it's uh, my perspective that that, that work was, was great. Yeah, I, I just want to point out, and then I open for, for everyone here the discussion. The the beauty of of the interior of this house. I mean. Uh, it's, it's really nice. It's really good. <laughs> like, like, and, and, and if, if we go into the, the renderings, um, is you and you the ones that are sat in the renderings? Okay, I was there. And and and, and this, this this is a, I mean I think it's quite uh, interesting and uh, the similarity, but also the, the you can perceive the, the, that the quality of the material is not just a kind of aesthetic quality. Doing something and performing quite well. And, and, uh, but then the, the other thing is is that uh, I, I think that one of the strongest ideas uh, was the base of the wood base, no, and that finally you have uh, you have had to deal with other uh, issues, more technical or, or or simply more difficult to deal for the client, and finally you made a kind of hybrid, no, because these these boxes, uh, the boxes of, of, of the grate were made of wood. Mm -hmm. I mean, how this this this, this part to perform the, the, the thermal mass that you have in, in the in the basement? The thermal mass. The thermal mass is actually separated. It's underneath the living space, but basically, you can distribute excess heat from the wood stove because there's a heat exchanger built into the wood stove, and you can pump heat into the thermal mass that will then re-radiate, supposedly for about nine hours. So you can use that so that after the wood stove goes out, you can still continue to heat the floors from the thermal mass. And this is something that we haven't fully really tested yet. Um, but that's hopefully part of the ongoing week-long or two-week test that we'd like to do in the winter time. Um, but then the foundation, we ended up having to use a small concrete footing below the uh, vertical posts, as Anna mentioned, um, which was different from our original concept. But I think it's one of those realities that happens in construction. And one thing that I think that's an interesting connection between actually both of our projects was how you know the other team took an attitude about how do you reinvent um, the approach as an architect to a simulation competition. But I think that's also something that we tried to do with this project because we proposed something that was without any concrete in the foundation, which was very strange for Japan or even strange for here. And I think so. That's a sort of a connection between, you know, how 
how, how do you approach a competition and kind of change the rules? Questions? Comments? Critics? <laughs> Yeah, it was. It, um, I just got my copy of the most recent A plus U, which is the Pezzo of um, Gerlach and the Chilean architect. But A plus U liked this project so much that actually they just put it in the basically the inside cover. It's the very first thing you open when you open up that journal. So, but there's this is one of many publications that will be coming out, and there's a there's been a lot of interest right right around the world. I mean, they've been in contact with the team since last. Maybe we should mention the platform, platform. Yeah. <laughs> there was something quite interesting about the competition requirements, even from the very first stage, even before we came, became finalists. During the initial stage of the competition, our team was required to set up a Facebook page. <laughs> and that seems completely opposite to the notion of a competition where people kind of guard their secrets. And uh, we had to strategize a little bit about what information we would put up in order to generate uh, maybe to prepare the jury or the, the overall discussion for the kinds of ideas that should be in this. And I think we also used it maybe to publicize ideas that were currently being discussed generally within the GFP curriculum related to sustainability and environment. And, but not to show plans of the house, because that, that feels like giving it away. But in any case, the Facebook page uh, morphed into a kind of blog about uh, about the ongoing process and became a way of generating interest so that people were writing or commenting on this, not just from the GSD or not just from the Japan side, but actually people were looking at the page from, from all over. I don't think we're very interesting. At the beginning, we were quite nervous about the Facebook, and I'm going to admit I'm not on Facebook, so <laughs> I had to have much of this explained to me. We were quite nervous about this idea of publicizing even before we entered the competition. Uh, but in the end, it turned out to be a, a fairly, uh, wouldn't you agree, a, a fairly useful uh, aspect of the competition. So it's very foresightful of, of the sponsors. Yeah, and not only that, like right now, we, um, we have a, a Kuko son. She's one of the first takers in, in the area. And she's been sending me pictures of like, the house with the snow, like all of those that you have seen are from her. A nice shot that we don't have here with all the stars, and so you know, these days it's. I think we, we should make use of this social media just to keep things going. And uh, when Tom was saying this is ongoing, so let's see how the house develops over time. And oh, what about the other project? Is there any kind of uh, ongoing thing, or is it? Well, um, at, at this point, we haven't actually proceeded you know, to take this any further. Um, I think the process that came out in uh, figuring out how we can approach a project became something, something that amongst us we have been talking about kind of expanding and especially putting up the presentation actually submitted to come some a uh, few places uh, for uh, publication. Uh, we the conversation and the processes that architects can uh, contribute, uh, has become a highlight more so than obviously the project. The project itself, um, it's not necessarily as as important as much as the process we actually we figured out to get to the end result. Ali, you want to make a comment? I actually have a class, so I just came in here, so I just mm -hmm. feel like mentioned the Genkan porch area, and obviously there's the uh, floor seating. So I'm yeah. curious, um, since all the competitors were Westerners, um, was there any expectation on Lux's part that we'd be building sort of Western, in the style of Western domesticity? Because it turned out to be quite Japanese. And I was wondering why that was, what motivated that decision. And I think Sakuya should reply to that. He's <laughs> a Japanese, and he was in our team. Well, but actually, I was at this team initially, and then uh, I was in another team in the uh, competition, and then I joined the team later. But they already had the idea of sitting on the floor from the beginning, and so um, that was already, they imagined that they started to sit on the floor, and it just didn't help that, so that was the final concept. But I also just want to say that I think, uh, well, there were 12 international teams in 
some were from uh, Europe or another, there was one from England and also South Asia. So it wasn't all Western. And there were also a couple teams from Japan. Um, but I think because of the diversity of our team, I mean, there were Americans, South Americans, Japanese, uh, two Spaniards on our team. It really, we had an interesting um, attitude about how do you mix the culture and the design. So I think it was in, in our interest to kind of learn about traditional Japanese house too. And that's why this works as a Gencon to, to remove your shoes as a space for that. But it also is part of the thermal strategy. I mean, it's a buffer zone that's not heated that you go into um, before getting into the house. So it's kind of a, has, it's a multi, multi kind of part of the design. And going on, that, uh, on the exhibition, there's going to be a video that we took of, of the inside and how we walk around. So we might want to do a little bit more of how we plan all the uh, thermal, all the sustainable design concepts that we need to um, implement in the house. Yeah, so thank you for that. Sorry, I missed your, you lot guys want to catch up later. But I'm very interested to see all the, the data when it comes through, but I was wondering if you could talk about, since you stayed there, how it felt um, further, you know, were there, were there any interesting things going on or, or, or zones or things that you expected, things that you didn't? Were you in a state of hedonistic pleasure or was it just like kind of comfortable and homogenous? Or? So, yes, we talk. I think, <laughs> it's actually, I mean, we were pretty satisfied, and I think, I mean, I can only speak for myself, but um, it was, it, as a, I mean, it's a sustainable house in, in its own kind of conception, but this idea of retreating nature, I think, was really critical, and it's very nice to sit in this space um, throughout all periods of the day or night and use the wood stove, but also simultaneously have a heated floor surface, but then be able to view out, and I think you know, spatially, it was very satisfying from that perspective. And we're hoping to really use this data and test um, down the road to learn about the things that we did right, the things that we did wrong also, because there's a lot of glazing in this house. And that's one of the reasons that we looked into radiant interior shades. Um, we, because of the cost, we couldn't do the sort of material we wanted, but it's... Is it, is it low heat based? Or yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thermal uh, dual pane glass with low heat coating. Uh, they're vinyl windows. But do you feel the, sorry, but do you feel the improvement of the air because of that? I mean, there is a kind of, 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 of uncomfortable sensation because of the wind. When you went when you went close to the window, did it feel radiantly uncomfortable? Was it like hot air? Was it hot? Or was it no, it wasn't. There's the more symmetry is going on. The only problem was there's condensation, um, and that was the contractor said it's going to take about six months to a year for all the moisture to come out of the wood. On the wing, on the wood. On yeah. the interior. But no, there's no finishes on any of the wood, so they kind of help moderate the interior of the moisture. When were you guys there? Uh, end of November. So it was cold, but not as cold as it was. It was snowing. It was no, it wasn't snow. It was It's like right now. It was like right now here. It was nice. It was freezing at night, but. Yeah. Yeah. Like you're walking barefoot on the wood, and it's nice and cozy. elsewhere during our visit, but I would come over here for coffee in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> it's that comfortable. Yeah. And compared to the other houses in the, the, the uh, King of Cuba and uh, all of this? Uh, definitely more comfortable than the KO University house. <laughs> <laughs> no recordings. Far more comfortable than their house. Uh, you know, I, I think it would be a toss-up between us and Kengo Kuma. I would mention he had quite a large budget for his. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not a student budget for just, his. Just a, uh, yeah, yeah, please. Quick uh, uh, comment. Um, <laughs> of course, there are many descriptions about the possible descriptions of, of the house. I haven't had the chance to be there yet, uh, but um, and I think the presentation was mainly focused on the kind of the thermodynamic uh, behavior of the house, and I think it's critical. It's uh, one of the most important aspects of it. But you can also read it also in terms of uh, its typological dimension. I think the house could be understood and 
we understood it from the beginning as some sort of interstitial space between the base and the roof. So in that sense, you can also uh, see the houses as sort of a way, a possible way of challenging the traditional notion of a floor and a roof. So they work with the intention. You know, even we, we don't have walls in the house except for the for the walls of the bathroom. So it's really like a continuous uh, space. So I think that's also very yeah, uh, really, uh, explicit in the pictures. Yeah, I think it's one, one of the values of, the, of, of this proposal. I mean, the fact that it has been constructed is obviously a kind of singularity that all of us are fascinated with. But, but the, the, the most interesting thing is that it won because it's a very interesting proposal, architectural proposal, and it's a very interesting <coughs> proposal. And, and it, it, these are not two things that go apart, but it's exactly the very same thing. And how do you see the platform as, 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 as a thermal mass you know, originally at least? And, and how the platform uh, has a kind of, of, of flow that corresponds also with the flow of uh, energy or the heat transfer, I mean, the way the heat is going up and down, and how the program is organized in this, and, and the organization of the roof from, from solar and from snow, you know, the slope from the snow. I think all these elements uh, are, are quite interesting because you are unifying in many ways, the, let's say, the technical understanding of architecture with, with the formal operations and then we have beautiful idea that it's, it's, it's beyond architecture, it's more a kind of, of, of aesthetic or I would say landscape understanding of the house as, as and cut in the, in, the, in the middle of, of this prairie that is so So in many ways the, the, the attributes of the, of the house are, are go far beyond the technical aspects, and, and not to talk about the materiality. And I think this is what, what is interesting. I'm sorry to, to say that the, the case that they gave you was really poor. I mean, you had to make. I'm, I'm sure that you suffered. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to do something that that was. I, in many ways, it's, there are many decisions that are similar, no? like like uh, like changing the. I the think Diego actually put it like good, but we needed to just break the goals enough to be considered. Still. Yeah, it's always there. So we we needed to just play the game tight. Yeah. So. You never know. That's, that's, yeah, you never know how much you can break the rules. <laughs> <laughs> it depends very much on the. I mean, in, from my experience, in the quality of the architects in, in the jury. If, if, if they can impose their voice. I mean, the, I always study this very carefully <laughs> to see where the legal guy can I can plan the limits. Of transgression. Uh, as a good simulation goes, considering it's like they need to have a base model to compare to when they are like, since it was a simulation comparison they needed to make to kind of understand the base model as the same thing, that would have kind of changing the architecture so much that it wouldn't allow us to compare, to allow them to compare us to the rest of the entries. Uh -huh. so the, the, rest, yeah. the rest of, of, of entries were, were all of them uh, maintaining... It's an engineering uh, yeah. basic competition. So there were really... I mean, I haven't seen rest of the entries, but from what we were understanding, it is geared towards that. And the schools that were applying, after we start hearing about them, they were like majority, I would say, like 80% were engineering schools. I was in fact... I, I was, um, I know someone who was also participating in his approach was basically taking up this, the, you know, the given thing and just designing a mechanical system and improving the mechanical system as much as possible mm -hmm. and to reduce that energy and like whatever is left that is put in renewables or whatever. And actually it's my understanding that there was no architect in the jury, so even, <laughs> <laughs> even worse. <laughs> Any other comments? Yeah, please. Yes, just just like building on the comments that were done before about the Horizon House, I think that it's very interesting to see uh, again like this thermal condition of being close to the floor, attaching the floor with your skin, how it's like uh, related with the, the mechanisms that are used with the idea of the horizon, with how you combine and you create an experience, an architectural experience with the technical conditions, how do you the choices that you make. On how to and 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 the kind of like the architectural the, you know tool of like making this cut to make the horizon the keeping this kind of like be close to the floor and and the uh, selection of materials that we that just like emphasize this aspect that I think is very nice especially if it's snowing outside yeah, yeah. the path ahead of you is cold feet. yeah
And also like the, you know, the, 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 the roof is floating. So it's kind of like even emphasizing more that condition that is accompanied with the feeling of being close to the floor and feeling the warmness of the, of, of things like that. People picked up on the kind of the joke inside your winter scene of the uh, the rendering that you made for the competition, but um, the rendering of the winter rendering of theirs shows people comfortably having tea inside the Horizon House while others are furiously shoveling around Tango Kumas <laughs> and the Keio University House. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All the teams are out shoveling snow from the other houses. <laughs> Our occupants were inside, and this was uh, definitely something we, we laughed a lot about. <laughs> and also the, uh, the change in the, the heights of the floor um, was, uh, um, or also had to do with uh, um, privacy. So by the uh, bathroom or where the shower is, it's higher. So, I mean, I, I shower there, so you know, it says a lot, like, it's quite comfortable. And then in terms of uh, uh, the sizing of the windows, you could also have, uh, they are uh, closer to the south, uh, they're smaller to the south than they are to the north. So we had all those things into no, the yeah. um, We had those things into consideration. So it wasn't just uh, making different heights for the floor in terms of the floor, but we also understood how uh, people were going to see outside and how others could see you <coughs> in the inside. Well, last question. Yeah. Uh, Normally, we see a lot of research done in this kind of field, but we just this kind of job can be more than 1,000 words when it becomes reality. That, that is just amazing. That really tells you the right message, probably the future of, of this simulation field. I just want to conclude saying thank you so much. I mean, it's, it's more important than the, the, the proxy of the little house. is much more than this, and you know it. And, and in your case, again, it's like cultivating a culture of where, uh, let's say, the <coughs> technical and the more plastic aspects of this thing can, can be joined and can, can really produce a kind of specific work that other schools are not capable with, and we are compromised. So thank you so much, everyone, and congratulations.